do, do I have to do anything to start the recording? Oh, I think I have to. Lynn, we might need help. Lynn, do I push a button to? Hold on. Are you, uh, I want to make sure that we don't. Oh, there we go. Okay. The knock on the wall. So welcome to, I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. So we have three of our five members here, so that's a quorum. And do you want to call the? And, uh, and I will at this point at uh, 3.37, uh, call the council, town council meeting together. This is a special meeting of the town council. Uh, also, the chair of this committee will actually run the meeting. And the reason I'm doing that is because we now have the majority of the council or, or a quorum of the council present. Awesome. So the um, main order of business today is an overview of the master plan. So we have about a total of an hour and 40 minutes for our meeting. And we, have a, we do have some other business items. So how, however long you think that it would take for the overview, and then we'll have some time yeah, um, no, yeah, so actually the order was overview of the master plan, then public comment, then um, business not anticipated 40 hours in advance, and then approval of the minutes. So I think we'll just go right to the master plan and then do public comment. Is that? That's right. yeah. And please introduce yourselves. I still, you know, it's funny, you're, it's still very soft. Hello? Oh, that's better. I'll start over. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director for the town of Amherst, and I have with me this afternoon Nate Malloy, senior planner, who is also in the planning department. We're pleased to be here this afternoon to present to you Amherst's master plan. So we're gonna spend about probably 45 minutes going through the master plan, what it says, um, what we've done so far, and what's, what we still need to do. Um, Nate is going to plug in in the middle of the presentation to talk about housing and particularly affordable housing. That's one of his many areas of expertise. So um, we also have an opportunity to have questions and comments from the council members um, periodically throughout the presentation. So if you feel like you wanna ask a few questions or make a few comments, you may do so then. But I think most of the comments are gonna be saved for the, for the end of the presentation. So to start off, the Amherst Master Plan um, is uh, planning Amherst together. That was the process by which we uh, planned the Master Plan. Um, so what is a Master Plan? Uh, a Master Plan is a community's general long-term blueprint for its future. It guides regulatory changes, land use policies, budgeting decisions, and other aspects of the community's decision-making process. It helps to direct decision making on the community's long-term physical development over a period of decades. And it's a dynamic document. It's the beginning of a process, not the end of the process. So what does the law say about a master plan? A master plan is required by Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 81D. And it spells out what needs to be in a master plan. Amherst's master plan was adopted by the planning board in February of 2010. The master plan recommends that the master plan be updated at least every five years. Well, we haven't really accomplished that, but here we are in year nine, I think. Uh, Amherst Home Rule Charter requires the adoption of a new master plan by the town council every 20 years. 
And as far as I can tell from talking to colleagues and, and reading uh, about what other towns and cities do, the best practice is to update it about every five to 10 years. Um, so this master plan uh, is, was the first in Amherst for nearly 40 years. It was based on extensive public input in the form of community forums, working groups, targeted outreach, and a number of community surveys. And I'm sure a lot of you uh, participated. You can probably find yourselves among the pictures that we're gonna show today. Um, the master plan was based on research on the community's existing conditions and anticipated trends for the future. It rep represents Amherst's best effort to balance competing interests of a diverse population. And the master plan addresses complex and intertwined issues that face the community now and in the future. So I'm going to tell you a little about the history of the master plan. Amherst experienced a lot of growth during the 1960s and early 70s. And the town decided to set up a, uh, a process by which they could um, start to plan for some of that development. So they uh, established the Select Committee on Goals. You often hear this referred to as SCOG, which is sort of an unfortunate name, but that's what it is. So in 1971, the SCOG Committee was formed, and they uh, worked diligently for a couple of years and came up with a report, um, a summary of which we have online, and the conceptual plan we have here on, on this slide. Um, so the SCOG report came up with many um, objectives and goals for the town, uh, but among them were this conceptual plan for how the town was to be developed. You can see that it's very similar to the way we think of developing in Amherst today. Essentially, um, uh, focused development in the downtown, which is this rectilinear area in the middle of the plan, and then focus development also in the village centers. And at that time, uh, we, we thought of there being um, six village centers. And then after the SCOG committee did its work, we waited a couple of decades when uh, finally we launched into a visioning process. And in 1997 and 98, the comprehensive planning committee was formed and the Amherst visions process came into being. We hired Walt Kudnahovsky uh, who was the founder of the uh, Conway School of Landscape Design and his uh, partners to do um, a, a, vision, a visioning process for the town. What do we want to be? What, how do we want to arrange ourselves and develop ourselves? So they issued a report car called Amherst Visions. And I believe that's online. And if it's not, you can write to me and I'll send you a copy. Um, the Comprehensive Planning Committee and the Planning Board worked with uh, a UMass Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning Studio on a project called Village Boundaries and Open Space Preservation Strategies. And that's illustrated here in this colorful plan. And it um, described uh, places where they thought that um, development should really be focused. And you can see it's uh, the North Amherst Village Center, the downtown, including the areas around the downtown, <clears throat> And they chose the area around the Pomeroy Lane intersection. They didn't really focus so much on Atkins Corner. So that was, uh, that was the student's report. Uh, then in 2004, um, Fall Special Town Meeting voted, voted $20,000 to begin the master plan process. They hired a consultant to establish a scope of work and a cost. And then in 2005, knowing a little more about what a uh, master plan might cost, they, the special town meeting in the fall voted an additional $65,000 to get going on a master plan. And an RFP was issued for a consultant. In 2006, um, planning Amherst together continued and a consultant was chosen. ACP Visioning and Planning, and they were uh, based in Ohio and New York State, I believe. Um, Annual town meeting voted an additional $135,000 for the master plan, so we had a total of about $200,000 to work on it with our consultant. And the consultant and staff gathered data on existing conditions and trends. And here's another picture of us working diligently. You can see, um, I think, Jim Wald in the foreground and some other uh, familiar faces. Um, in 2007, uh, planning Amherst together, uh, began a series of public idea gatherings, group workshops, community choices, and a community survey. And the first draft of the master plan was submitted to the com uh, Comprehensive Planning Committee. 
Then in 2008 to 2010, the Master Plan Subcommittee of the Planning Board reviewed and edited and revised the draft plan. In 2010, there was a public forum held in January on the draft master plan, and the final version of the master plan was adopted by the Planning Board in February of 2010. Do you have any questions and comments? No? Okay. So what's in the master plan? Well, the master plan contains several chapters that are required by state law. Uh, there's a goals and policies chapter, and that begins the master plan. There's a land use chapter, which is probably the one that we're most familiar with. Um, we work most diligently with that in the planning department, and you may also have referred to that from time to time. Demographics and housing, which is what uh, Nate is going to talk about later. Economic development. Natural and cultural resources. Open space and recreation. Services and facilities. And transportation and circulation. And then at the very end, there's an implementation chapter. So all towns and cities in Massachusetts that do master plans pretty much follow this pattern. Um, how, <clears throat> how's the master plan organized? Well, in the very beginning of it, it states some key directions for the town that everybody agreed that they uh, went along with. So I'll read through those. Um, one of the key directions is maintaining Amherst's existing community character. I think we're all on board with that. Encourage the vitality in the downtown and village centers. Balance land preservation objectives with more intensive development in appropriate areas. Provide housing that meets the needs of all residents while minimizing impacts on the environment. Provide and expand the economic, excuse me, diversify and expand the economic base. Enhance town-gown relations and cooperation and promote an ethic of sustainable environmental energy practices in all town activities. Um, on a deeper level, the master plan is organized by section. Each section contains a goal. Under the goal are a series of objectives, and under the objectives, each objective has a series of strategies about how to achieve the objective. So again, for the land use section, which is the one that we work with most uh, frequently, um, the land use section states as its goal that it wants to have Amherst be a sustainable, attractive town with a viable mixed-use downtown and active village centers that are well-connected with livable and diverse neighborhoods and campuses and interwoven with protected open space, natural resources, and active farmland. One of the goals, what, excuse me, one of the objectives under this goal is to create a vital downtown and village centers, areas of mixed use, including retail, commercial, and residential elements that are walkable, attractive, and efficient. And under this particular objective, one of the strategies is change zoning to allow denser residential occupancy near existing services and public transit. That may sound familiar to some of you who attended the recent presentation on the 40R type of development, which is doing attempting to do just that, dense development near existing services in public transit. Uh, so what does the master plan say about each of these uh, topics? I'm going to read some of the objectives. I'm not going to read all of them, but um, you can delve into that more carefully if you want to read the master plan online. Um, so under land use, the objectives include preferentially direct future development to existing built-up areas. Again, that relates to what, we're, what we learned about 40 Rs. Um, <clears throat> preserve key undeveloped lands. Protect key farmland and farming in Amherst. Guide new housing growth while minimizing impact on open space and small town rural character. And honor the historic, cultural character and beauty of the neighborhoods. Under demogra demographics and housing, um, among the objectives there were to encourage a greater mix of housing types, sizes, and prices, serving a wider range of income levels. Preserve and expand the number of affordable and moderately priced rental units and housing stock. Encourage the production of housing in an environmentally sound manner. Improve housing and services for people who are homeless. 
and build and sustain the town's capacity for regulatory oversight of Amherst's housing stock. As I read through these, I'm definitely reminded of some of the issues that we're facing today, but it's good to go back to the master plan and realize that those are things that the town agreed upon that they wanted to tackle, issues they wanted to tackle. Economic development, under economic development, the master plan said we wanted to support sustainable growth of existing businesses and attract new ones. We wanted to support the relocalization of the Amherst economy and improve regulatory environment to encourage business development. Under natural and cultural resources, I've given you two um, photographs here of uh, solar installations that we have um, on the Hampshire College campus. Promote, preserve, promote preservation, appreciation, and sustainable use of our historical and cultural resources and apply the principles of environmental sustainability town-wide. In terms of open space and recreation, um, some of the objectives were to improve the economic viability of the farm community within Amherst and provide a, a supply of accessible, well-maintained recreational facilities that meet the changing needs of our community. Under services and facilities, some of the objectives were to deliver high quality public safety services, that includes police, fire, and uh, emergency ambulance services. Deliver high quality education from preschool through grade 12. Anticipate, plan, and budget for large projects in response to growing demand on town services. Well, we're certainly involved in that right now. And strengthen partnerships with the colleges and university and improve coordination of services and facilities. <coughs> Transportation and circulation is a big part of the master plan, and it called for actively promoting alternative modes of transportation, providing adequate public parking to support existing and desired new development in the downtown and elsewhere, and pursue funding strategies for achieving transportation goals. In terms of implementation, the master plan called for providing sufficient resources to implement the master plan, involving a wide variety of stakeholders in implementation and requiring concurrence with the master plan. And I'd like to say a few uh, sort of offline comments about implementation. Although um, there was not a formal implementation process, we did implement many, many of the goals and objectives and strategies of the master plan. Um, we did involve a wide variety of stakeholders in the implementation and we've made an effort to have all of our rules and regulations and bylaws uh, go in concurrence with the master plan. Any questions and comments? Yes. Uh, would you go back to the comment about parking downtown? So one of the one of the objectives stated, provide adequate public parking to support existing and desired new development in the downtown and elsewhere. And I have to place this document in its context. When this document was written, um, none of the uh, major developments that we are currently seeing downtown were um, on, on, the, on, the, on the drawing board. I don't, I don't even think they were on the drawing board. So since then, we've um, we've experienced Boltwood Place, we've experienced Kendrick Place, we've experienced uh, One East Pleasant Street, we are soon to see um, a development on Spring Street. So there may be some uh, thought about rewording, reimagining uh, what it means to supply public parking and how much uh, developers might need to um, chime into that uh, subject. So just wanted to put that in context. Steve, um, so we were talking a little bit about this at the CRC. So 10 years doesn't seem all that long. So all those buildings you just mentioned all emerged in 10 years, but also in 10 years has emerged Uber and Lyft. I mean, those weren't, I don't believe those were even an idea, at, you know, 10 years ago. So the way that we think about transportation, the way we think about cars has also changed dramatically. Wait, did you, sorry, Lynn, did you have a question or a comment or just about that? Yeah, I, this is just to try to help on me and hopefully others as well understand. Subsequent to that, there was some bylaw passed by town meeting 
that dealt with the down parking area? Could, yes. Chris. So the municipal parking district was actually established in the late 60s. I believe it was established in 1969. And at that time, it um, said that um, businesses, restaurants, um, retail stores, et cetera, offices did not need to provide um, on-site parking. Then in 2008, the area that was um, affected by the municipal parking district was expanded. It was expanded to go all the way up to Triangle Street, and I think possibly even beyond that, to include all of the BG and BL um, areas. And it also uh, expanded to include residential uses at that time. But at that time, again, we did not experience any residential development in the downtown. So it was sort of an effort to promote residential development in the downtown, not to require on-site parking. So, Anyone else? So in, yes, I'm yeah. sorry. So in other words, we basically said, go ahead and build, but you as the commercial builders or the commercial owners don't have any responsibility for parking. Am I correct in my interpretation of that? Well, I think, so I, was, I, I think we said there was no requirement, um, not necessarily there's no responsibility. And so, you know, with the master plan, the idea was to have infill development in the town center and village centers. And so, you know, and typically in zoning, you'd have like a, you know, a, a pretty strict parking ratio to whether it's square feet or to a residential unit, you might say, you know, two parking spaces to every residential unit. So the, you know, I, to me, this bowl is addressing the fact that in the downtown and in village centers, we don't want to have those strict parking requirements because, you know, if you had a 10 unit building, you'd have to have 20 parking spaces, which might take up half of a property. And so, um, you know, I think, so to me, this is saying, well, you know, can the public, can public supply balance that? You know, balance the, the, the need for infill and for a vital downtown, vibrant walking centers, um, and not have parking lots, you know, along the street. And so the public, public supply could be managed a little differently. Pat? Um, uh, there was a report about the proposed gateway corridor that was, UTAC was you know, yeah. uh, commissioned. And in that report, it talked about development uh, with, and that it would need shared parking. And I'm sort of wondering why that recommendation was never taken in, looked at when we started doing the development that we're doing and giving away parking areas. So, so if I might just step in here. So we were hoping to get sort of an overview of the master plan. That's a perfect question for our next meeting, which is plan, planning and zoning. So planning and zoning, the master plan is the macro. It, it basically uh, governs the idea, you know, the ideals of the town. The planning, the specifics, particularly the zoning bylaw, which is really your question. Right, it but it is, does talk about adequate public parking to support yeah. existing. Yeah. yeah. I'm just looking at that and wondering yeah. why the idea of shared parking didn't uh, happen. Uh, I'll, I can answer. So the master plan is not a law. The master plan could not require a developer, can't compel the developer to do anything. What, gov what compels developers are the land use laws, mm -hmm. most famously the zoning bylaw, but also conservation commission and other, you know, other, you know, other parts of the bylaw. So sometimes there are, they seem like they're perhaps not in conflict, but this is not the law itself. It's the zoning bylaw, which is the right, law. Right, no, I understand yeah, that yeah. quite clearly. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Should we go on? Yeah. Along these lines, um, there's another, in, in a prior slide that, that was uh, said, House Master Plan Organized uh, Part 2, and the bottom one was the uh, uh, change zoning to allow denser residential occupancy near existing services and public transit. And what strikes me is that there's a little bit of an inherent conflict in sections that have been already talked about today. And is that expected in the master plan and how um, what processes 
address those things where there may be two um, values that are not totally in sync. Chris. I think that you'll see that throughout the master plan. This is really a compendium of a lot of different people coming together and saying what they thought um, Amherst needed and wanted. And so um, I can think of one example of, of this uh, conflict where we have in our land use policy map, which I'm, I unfortunately don't have a, an image of that, but in the land use policy map, particularly up in the northeast quadrant, you'll see a big circle that um, encircles an area that is appropriate for development. And overlapping that, you'll see uh, another area that is appropriate for preservation. So um, we never got as far as making the decision about in that particular area, did we want to develop it all or did we want to preserve it all? And I think that that also relates to um, the issue of density in the downtown and how much is the town responsible to provide parking. I think we're still having that discussion and um, hopefully we will reach a resolution of that, but it's one of those sort of inherent conflicts that you'll see throughout the master plan. Thank you. It's okay. So where were we? Uh, oh, implementation, right. Okay. Um, so what have we accomplished since we adopted the master plan? And how have we implemented the master plan's objectives and strategies? So now I'm going to introduce Nate Malloy, who will talk about housing and particularly affordable housing. Sure. Um, you want to just, it? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. The um, just quickly about the the parking. You know, there is a consultant working on parking now, yeah. so we can bring that up to them. So that's you know an issue that can Thank be looked you. at. Sure. So for housing, you know, the the master plan, um, you know, the demographics and housing chapter, uh, it wasn't just affordable housing. It also talked about housing in general. Um, you know, the goal from the master plan, you know, describes a mix of housing that meets the needs of and is affordable to the broadest uh, possible spectrum of the community and that minimizes impact on the environment. And so, you know, like Steve said, it's really a macro vision. And so how do you, how do you get there? Um, in terms of affordable housing, it's something that was emphasized in the master plan. So a number of objectives within this chapter emphasize affordable housing. There's a long support of it in town. In terms of affordable housing, uh, it's something that's recognized by the state and the towns maintained what is a standard of 10% for a long time. Uh, it requires ongoing efforts and partnerships. So, you know, Chris said this is a dynamic document. So I think even as we move, you know, along in different years, there has to be different types of partnerships and discussions about what is affordable housing and what's needed in a community. Uh, and there's preservation of units and then creation of new units. I think that's really important. Uh, there's you know, grants and funding opportunities. And more recently, there's a municipal affordable housing trust. So that's a part of town government that is actively working to further affordable housing. And I'm just going to run through a number of slides that kind of hit the basics. So this one is what is affordable housing? And when we say affordable housing, it's capital A affordable. So it's, it's recognized by the state. It's deed restricted. It's affirmatively marketed. And it um, is um, monitored annually and it can be afforded, you know, it can be afforded uh, to people earning less than 80% of the area median income. So it can be rental or ownership and it is based on income. Um, for instance, a family of four at 80%, you know, it's about $71,000 in household income per year. At 50% area median income, it's 44,000 and, you know, it decreases to 30%. And so when someone says, you know, can you afford this? It's usually they can spend no more than 30% of their income on housing. So you could take this number and prorate it over 12 months and come up with the figure. What the chart shows is that, you know, in the green and blue, most of the renters in Amherst are cost burdened, meaning they spend more than 30% and in the blue, more than 50% of their income on housing. Um, so, you know, the market demands are showing that a lot of renting and renters can't afford the, the units in town. How do we get affordable housing? So, you know, the master plan describes how we can get it. And I think we've actually done a great job of adding units and preserving units. So Rolling Green was an example where we knew there'd be, um, the deed restrictions were expiring. So the town worked with the, you know, the owners and, and sought a new person, new entity to preserve those units. And it worked out really well. Uh, it can be developer driven. So Beacon Communities was interested in Amherst. They were here. And you know, they proposed a new development in North Amherst. Habitat for Humanity, for instance, is always looking to develop you know, one or two properties in town. And so they're, they're always looking. 
And then there's the regulatory environment. So the town has inclusionary zoning, uh, and that triggers a development to provide affordable units. And residential apartments and the uh, mixed-use development on University Drive is an example of that. The town has um, a number of roles. The town typically is not a developer of housing, um, but we do have the zoning bylaw and rules and regulations to help provide it. We can facilitate it by speaking with different um, entities, the state, developers, or consultants. Uh, the town has an important role in terms of funding and permitting. So those are two really uh, powerful things, uh, and that goes back to zoning. And then there's also municipal land, if that's available. So that's something that you know, recently uh, the, the council looked at with the E Street School. And, and what is the need for housing? So the master plan is a, you know, is a, is a, provides a number of goals and objectives. And then you know, for each section of the master plan, there's different plans that address each topic. So there's the housing production plan and the housing market study that really drill down in terms of what is the need for housing in town. And I think, Andy, to your point about how do we resolve the conflicts within the master plan. So under you know, open space and recreation, there's an open space and recreation plan. There's a transportation plan. I think each, each subsequent plan is incorporated into the master plan. And, and those plans really try to get down to the detail of some of the specifics in terms of how do we balance things that may be in conflict. Uh, in terms of housing, there's a, a large need in terms of a range of household sizes, income levels, and types of units, whether it's single family homes to apartments or townhouses. And the chart showing you know, housing production over the years, there was a, a big drop in the, in the late 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And how is affordable housing funded? Again, the town has local funds. So there's CPA, Community Preservation Act funds are really important. And those can be used for pre-development funding, you know, for studies, for things to help get a project underway. And then they can also be used to help fund construction or you know, use as a match to help things um, move along. There's the local tax incentive. So that's, you know, the town can offer this as, you know, um, deferred tax payments for an affordable housing development. And that's a, a powerful tool because it's not, you know, you're not providing funding, but, you know, it's, it's foregone revenue that it can be used by a developer to, for affordable units. And that can be very important to balance the budget. Uh, there is the, the trust and they can act as a funder or financier. Uh, and then there's block grant funds. So over the years, the town has used CPA funds and block grant funds to preserve and uh, rehabilitate a number of units uh, with the housing authority and then um, you know, other affordable units in town. And then there's state and federal funds, subsidizing agencies and private sources. So this quote uh, says that um, you know, it takes a lot of different sources to fund affordable housing. So I think most developments will probably have you know, six to 12 sources of funding and it can take a few years to get all that together. So it's not as if they have usually you know, one source. There might be a one major funder, but then there's a lot of other funders involved. Current projects, just to give a perspective, there's the North Square at the Mill District. So this was a you know, developer-driven project. It's mixed use, mixed income. It's 130 units, 26 affordable units. It was a comprehensive permit that went to the Zoning Board of Appeals. They um, you know, uh, applied for and received a local tax incentive. And the town was you know, very supportive in that, that area. Uh, and they also then you know, have a bunch of other sources of funding. And you know, they are now going through the building process. And what's, um, you know, this is both mixed income in terms of there's market rate housing, but also within the affordable units, there's a range of affordability. So you know, it might hit some 30% units, then 50%, and then there's workforce housing. So not capital A affordable, but housing that may be affordable to people earning, you know, 120% of area median income. So they're not, you know, it's not on our subsidized housing inventory, but it's something the community needs. And then University Drive was a project that the zoning bylaw captured. So it triggered inclusionary zoning. And so there's 36 total units and four will be affordable. Uh, there's um, no public funding involved. So it's a private development and the developer will, you know, go through the process of getting those units online. Uh, and then there's the housing trust. The housing trust uh, is a few years old and they're becoming more active. It is a part of local government. So it's a, you know, it's a, a board within town. They have statutory powers from the state and local regulation. So the trust has a you know, number of powers and authorities that um, they can use. Uh, they're really trying to set housing priorities for the town to establish what are some goals that everyone can work towards. Um, they're really um, working with community engagement and advocacy around affordable housing and they can be a funding 
agent and a facilitator. And so this image of E Street School is something that the trust has worked on. You know, they took a project and they're still trying to move it forward for affordable housing. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Chris, unless there's any questions right now about housing. So uh, area median income is determined for us by the Springfield metropolitan area. So, so we're right. in the Springfield uh, metro area in HUD, the, um, you know, a federal agency determines that. So they, you know, based on the, you know, so Springfield metro areas includes Amherst all the way down to Springfield, Holyoke, Ludlow, and then um, HUD determines what that is. So they have a formula and say the median income for a one person household, a two person, and, um, and they publish it every year around this time. So it's something, we, you know, the town doesn't calculate it. Uh, it's something that's provided for us and at the federal level. Right. So obviously uh, there's huge differences between those communities. Right. Um, and especially the population centers seem to be in areas that have lower housing costs mm -hmm. um, and, and lower incomes. Right. I, I'm curious how that affects um, affordable housing in Amherst when it, it feels like 30% AMI for a resident in Springfield is not the same as 30% AMI for a resident trying to live in Amherst, which has uh, significantly higher housing costs. Does, does that present challenges? It does. So I think, you know, to that point, the, um, you know, if someone were to say, I'll keep a, a unit affordable at 80% AMI, then most of the, um, for instance, if it's a rental development, most of the people who apply can't afford the 80% level. Right. So you know, to be affordable in Amherst, we're probably down closer to 60, 65 percent of area median income. So, you know, I agree. So, you know, it probably happens throughout the country where the, the income calculation is based in, a, you know, that covers a larger area and then there's pockets where, you know, it doesn't make sense in terms of affordability. So, you know, at 80 percent AMI, for instance, all the voucher holders with the housing authority, they can't even uh, qualify for those units because it's more than the program allows in terms of the cost of the unit per month. And so, um, you know, the housing authority has, you know, it can be difficult to have a voucher holder find housing in Amherst because of that. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, again, we're talking about what have we accomplished since we wrote the master plan. And um, in terms of land use, we've drafted zoning bylaw amendments for mixed use buildings dimensional modifications, height and setback, and land area. So let's see. Um, in this top slide, we're showing um, the project that Barry Roberts is developing on uh, University Drive, which um, was uh, benefited from some of those um, amendments. Um, we've drafted a zoning bylaw for business use of homes. The building commissioner was, became aware of um, some of the difficulties with our former uh, home occupation section of our bylaw and realized that it didn't really um, work well for the types of businesses that people have in their homes today. So we redrafted that bylaw and had it approved by the um, town meeting. Um, we amended the supplemental dwelling units bylaw to allow different types of supplemental dwelling units, including small detached um, dwelling units that might sit in someone's backyard up to 800 or 900 square feet if they're handicapped accessible, and that would allow for someone to have an in-law uh, living with, um, with them on the same property, or it would also allow them to potentially rent out a unit. Um, we've directed development to the downtown and village centers. As you've seen, there's been development in the downtown and also in North Amherst Village Center since the time of this master plan. Um, we've supported the University Drive rezoning, which resulted in this building here. Um, previously, University Drive was in the office park zone and wouldn't have allowed residential development. Nobody really wanted to build offices down there, so it made sense to allow uh, residential um, residential buildings to be built, and uh, town meeting agreed with that. And we provided research and support for the town decision makers in passing the recreational marijuana zoning bylaw. So that's what you're seeing here, um, someone doling out um, marijuana, <laughs> which I guess um, we have a mer medical marijuana facility here in town on Meadow Street, and we're about to have a recreational facility also on Meadow Street, and a number of other uh, such facilities are in line to open. 
Um, in terms of infrastructure improvements, so what I tried to do here is um, give a broad view of all the different things that the town has accomplished since the master plan was adopted, not just things that the planning department or people on the second floor have done. Uh, so in terms of infrastructure improvements, we've re rebuilt and repaired downtown sidewalks and crosswalks, and that's an ongoing project. We designed and built a roundabout downtown, which helps traffic to flow much better than it did before. And designed and currently are building main, the Main Street Sidewalk Project, which you may have run into when you were on your way here today. And we're also reconstructing the Mill Street Bridge. So a lot of infrastructure improvements are happening. In terms of economic development, well, we hired an economic development director, and that's been really helpful to us to help to um, attract businesses to town, but also to give people on, in terms of um, the permitting process, a little bit better understanding of what some of the businesses have to deal with when they come through permitting. Um, and also to just help, uh, help shepherd people through the permitting process. Um, we began to draft an economic development plan. Um, we partnered with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on the retail portion of the economic development plan and held a couple of public forums on that, and you may have participated in some of those. And we are collaborating, continuing to collaborate with the bid and the chamber on maintaining the vibrancy of downtown Amherst. In terms of transportation, we prepared an Amherst transportation plan, which was adopted by the planning board in 2015. Uh, and that dealt with all issues related to transportation, vehicular, bicycle, pedestrian, um, and public transit. We've worked with the Mass Department of Transportation on improvements to Route 9 from University Drive to South Pleasant Street, and you'll probably see those coming along in FY21, I believe. Um, we, we adopted a complete streets policy, which means that um, every time we uh, redesign a street that we're looking at, how all the different modes of transportation can use that street. It doesn't necessarily mean that every street has a sidewalk or has a bike lane, but at least it um, comes to the surface as a question to be asked and answered, and so I think that was a very important step. We established downtown parking, the downtown parking working group, and we changed parking regulations. Nate Malloy was the staff liaison to the downtown parking working group and worked with them for a couple of years, and now the Economic Development Director, um, Jeff Kravitz, is, is in charge of that. Um, what else have we done? Oh, we hired and worked with Nelson Nygaard, a consultant on phase two of our parking plan, um, which is an ongoing process to try to figure out how, much, how many parking spaces do we have in our downtown, who owns them, and how can we use them better. Um, we prepared a bicycle and pedestrian network plan, which is what this picture here is all about. Uh, people gathering in the bank center to talk about where do they want sidewalks, where do they want bicycle um, pathways, et cetera. And that is just about finished. Uh, PVPC is putting some finishing touches on it. We established five bike share stations around town, uh, which connect with five stations at UMass, which in turn connect with um, stations in East Hampton, Holyoke, South Hadley, Northampton, Springfield. I think that's it but we're very proud of that, and you can see the example of that outside the uh, front door of Town Hall. And we began the West Bay Road and East Hadley Road um, improvements. In terms of natural and cultural resources, we've done quite a bit. We've worked with the Amherst bid to establish the cultural district, which is what this map uh, shows, what, where our Amherst cultural district is, and that's marked out with signs, and there's a a plan that's available, I believe it's on our website as well as the BIDS website. Um, we've established two local historic districts, one the Emily Dick Dickinson Local Historic District and the other one is the Lincoln Sunset Local Historic District and that really um, helps to um, shape the kinds of development that happen in our historic neighborhoods. We've used CPAC funds to preserve historic buildings, including this, um, the Jewish Community Center in Amherst, which was having trouble with its steeple. And um, they uh, re recently rebuilt the steeple and included the acorn on top um, as part of their project to um, preserve their property. Um, we established the village uh, vi visitor center. The town didn't do that, the bid did it, but it's part of our overall process to help make the town a better place and to follow through on some of the objectives and strategies in the master plan. 
um, we've, work, we've worked with the Kestrel Land Trust to protect, protect agricultural lands and wildlife habitats, and they've been a really good partner to us. We passed the uh, half a percent for art for municipal projects, and that was a big effort that the Public Art Commission uh, got through town meetings, so we're very proud of that, and we're hoping to see some results from that. Uh, we purchased the Epstein property in South Amherst, which is a wonderful property in the Atkins Corner um, district where there's a beautiful big pond there and um, a mid-century modern house that is uh, potentially gonna be used as offices for the Kestrel Land Trust. So we, we think that that was a really good purchase for the town. And we also used CPAC grant money to preserve the North Amherst Community Farm farmhouse. In terms of open space and recreation, we've done a lot there as well. Uh, we've completed the community field master plan with Weston and Sampson, and if you have questions about that, Nate can answer those. Um, this is an image of the area that we're talking about near the high school and the middle school. We have wonderful fields there, but they haven't really been very well maintained. We updated and um, submitted the open space and recreation plan. Again, Nate was involved with that, along with Beth Wilson from the Conservation Department, and um, that needs to be updated every five years, and our plan was uh, accepted by the state. We've purchased land for conservation and preservation. Uh, if you look back through the town meeting warrants, you can see uh, several instances where the town has, has pr um, purchased land for those purposes. And we also purchased APRs, Agricultural Preservation Restrictions, with the help of the state. The state usually comes forward with um, the bulk of the money for those, but that's why we see uh, such wonderful swaths of open space on Southeast Street and Northeast Street. And we also designed and funded the modernization of Groff Park. And I hate to blow Nate's horn again, but Nate was involved with um, the whole design and conceptualization of what to do with Groff Park. So you'll see the construction of that coming along. In terms of services and facilities, we've worked with the DPW and fire department to plan for new facilities, worked with the school department to plan for a new elementary school. We prepared and issued a sewer extension master plan, contributed community development block grant funds for a new survival center, which has been very successful, and we adopted a net zero energy policy for mun municipal buildings. What are we still working on as a community? Well, there are lots of things that we're still working on, but among them are adequately addressing homelessness and the need for more affordable housing, repairing aging infrastructure, roads, bridges, and sidewalks. We know that that's a big priority. Constructing enough new sidewalks and bicycle lanes to serve the people of Amherst and our visitors creating a comprehensive plan to address the four new large capital projects that we have before us. Up, updating the zoning bylaw, that's a continuing process and there are several portions of it that we think need attention, so we're hoping to be able to address those in the coming year. Working with the colleges and university on shared community goals, um, there's a lot going on on the university campus with new buildings being built and we also understand that um, Hampshire College is uh, having its own challenges now, and so we want to work with the colleges and university to uh, help them do what they want to do, but also have them help us. And also uh, working with the Community Resource Committee and the Town Council to update, update and approve the master plan at the point where they feel that that is uh, useful and needed. So what's next? Um, where do we go from here? Well, as I said, there, there's a lot to be done. But if we do want to update the master plan, the town council, the town manager, and the planning board would decide when to update the master plan. The town council would authorize expenditures to review and update the master plan. The town council and the planning board would consider hiring a consultant to help the town with the public process and the drafting of the update. The planning board and the public would review the master plan, <clears throat> and the planning board is charged with drafting the update and amendments to the master plan and submitting it to town council for final adoption. So I think that's all I have to say right now. Do you have any questions, comments? So uh, just right here. So ultimately the planning board by state law approves master plans, but our charter says that the town council 
DOPS master plans. So you're talking about updates here. So does that same state law approve? So I think state law applies to brand new ground up master plans, but would that apply also to an update to the master plan that the planning board has to approve it then in a case of our charter, we have to adopt it? That's been my understanding, but I can certainly consult yeah. our town attorney on that. The, uh, Lynn. The charter is very clear that the town council at some point does need to adopt the master plan. Uh, it also is very clear that on at least one time a year, we need to hold a public forum on the master plan. And so this is not that public forum, just to be clear, but this is the first time that those of us sitting here from the council have sat and really in a concentrated look, uh, looked at the master plan with our town staff. So just to clarify, this is kind of a beginning. Mandy Jo, you may have more to say about the charter requirement. Um, I'll, I'll just start a little bit about the charter. The charter, if uh, the, the master plan original adopt, uh, original plan and then any amendments thereto um, need approved by the planning board and then adopted by the town council. So whether or not state law matter, requires amendments to it, the charter does require any amendments be approved by the planning board and then adopted by the town gotcha. council. Thank you. Anyone? George. I have a few. This question actually may be for you, Steve. Um, I'm interested in, in kind of the burrowing down a bit, and that may be the next meeting that you're planning to have, zoning 101, whatever planning. But I'm just, it's just a question that I have for uh, Christine and Nate and for your committee, perhaps. But how do you go from the master plan broad vision to more specific visioning processes? And I'm thinking very specifically in my district. For instance, you described the Mass DOT project, which is a plan for that Route 9 corridor. And it seems that, you know, how could a visioning process take place for just, I mean, obviously some things are going to happen to it in the point of infrastructure, but it's also borders on Amherst College. And there's some things happening there that are going to affect that neighborhood. How do you or can you have a visioning process for a specific area? Also, University Drive, you mentioned, and that's another area in my district, all politics are local. Um, how do you um, have a kind of visioning process for that that incorporates the community, particularly the neighbors, and a sense of, well, what are we thinking about that's going to happen to this? So there's the big picture, and then there's the smaller picture. And obviously, I'm thinking right now about the smaller picture, and I'm wondering where that fits into this overall. And maybe the answer is come to the next meeting and talk about planning and zoning in more detail. But Actually, I'm dying for the answer to this from... I'm sorry? I'm, I'm dying for the answer to this from... But, um, so the the Amherst place. is complicated. Every community is complicated, but because you have, you, you know, federal, state, in town. And I'm, I'm probably missing... We don't really... We don't have functioning counties, but they all have goals and visions that may affect a particular community. So here in the town of Amherst, we have two master plans. We have one, zip code 01002. We have a whole nother one for almost, not quite half the town, but a substantial part of the town, which is 01003, which is UMass. So those two master plans meet along some of the roads you're talking about, but they're, they're, they have completely different processes for, you know, for their construction, but they both affect each other. So like the Mass DOT, there's, you know, we may have a master, and I actually don't know who, how this works, but we may have a master plan that says Route 9 shall be a pedestrian way, but I would assume that state law would override. So there are a lot of different um, things happening in town, and it's um, challenging to kind of get them all together. Um, what we do have is we have an idea for future, um, a future look at certain parts of town. And in the past, those parts have been the North Amherst Village Center, the South Amherst Village Center around Atkins Corner, East Amherst where the Florence Savings Bank is, and probably Cushman Village. And recently we've been thinking, oh, we really should take a look at University Drive as well. 
Now, um, Mr. Ryan is pointing out that there are two projects that are being proposed for the Route 9 corridor that have kind of snuck under the radar, I, I suppose, to some degree. Maybe not the um, Valley CDC project, but certainly the Mass DOT project has been kind of flying under the radar. It has been presented to the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, um, actually a, a few times, and um, recently we held a public forum, I think it was maybe two weeks ago. Um, not that many people came to it, um, but it's been a process that's lasted for, I don't know, two or three years, and started out really big and like an airplane um, landing strip, and slowly has been whittled down to be something else. Um, that hasn't really been part of a town process because it's a state highway. So the state comes in and they say, here's what we want to do, and then the town reacts to it. So at this point, incorporating that into a planning process for that part of town is going to be challenging. I think I'm encouraging everybody to keep on top of what's being proposed, but um, we're probably going to be in the uh, position of reacting to what the state is proposing. Um, in terms of Valley CDC's uh, proposal for that part of town, that's really um, a process that kind of overrides to some degree um, any planning that the town might do. Um, it, the, that part of town has been zoned residential, but the proposal is that it use a comprehensive planning process in order to be uh, approved. So that's a process that kind of comes in and s sets itself down on top of the zoning um, the zoning process. So it's a little bit um, challenging to think about now starting a planning process for that part of town. We certainly could, but I don't know if it would capture those two projects. But I think the important lesson to learn out of this is that we need to constantly be thinking about all of our different village centers, and maybe that's going to be developing as a village center, and looking at them. And in some cases, we're going to need help from consultants to look at them. In other cases, we can um, hold a few public forums, give people information, and try to come to some agreement ourselves about those things. But as I said, there are many different areas of town that are kind of crying for attention, and so we have a lot of work ahead of us, but um, we're, we're up to it, right, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, extrapolating that to, you know, in terms of any project, you know, the you know, I think there's, like I said, there's individual plans for each topic, so there's a transportation plan. And so my hope would be that the committees, boards and committees and public input that help shape that plan will have enough guidelines to, you know, to, um, to help a project move along, whether or not it's in a, you know, it might not be specific to a, uh, to a street or something, but it has enough guidelines in the document to help. So we know that if this is a major corridor, you know, the, the transportation plan will talk about having bike lanes, wide enough sidewalks, traffic calming, and so that those, um, you know, those things can be applied to different projects throughout town. Um, I also think there's a lot of, you know, great boards and committees in town. So, you know, I think part of it is how do you stay on top of there's so much happening is that, you know, different boards for respective areas can be, you know, a source for public input. So I think, you know, the Transportation Advisory Committee would be one for Route 9 or, you know, the Planning Board or Housing Trust or so. I mean, I think how can we envision what's going to happen in terms of a project in one area, but I think if it comes about, I'm hoping the plans have enough information to guide us, and then the boards and committees will address it, you know, for each project. So, you know, there's permitting that happens with uh, different land uses, and so then the planning board or zoning board is appropriate to bring the concerns there. Um, I'm not sure if that's answered your question, but... Well, we have a question from, from Dorothy Pam. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this comprehensive planning process. Um, I think this is uh, of great interest in many parts of town that are zoned residential. Um, who controls it? Uh, can, can it just come in and say, well, you are zoned residential, but we think you're going to be something else? Um, to me, it's a little sounds a little bit like eminent domain. Do you, uh, do you mean the 40B comprehensive permit process or the... I mean, the one that she referred to. Um, yeah. So I think this only comes about in certain instances. We have experienced very few of them in Amherst. We're over 10% um, in terms of the number of affordable units that we have based on uh, the number of housing units we have in general. So we're not, um, we're not a target for companies that want to do this. 
Um, the, just to mention the ones that we've had are Olympia Oaks in North Amherst, which is up on Olympia Drive, 42 yes. units. Um, the Beacon Communities Project in North Amherst, and Butternut Farm on Longmeadow Drive. So those are the three comprehensive plans. Oh, and I think Mill Valley Estates might have been a comprehensive plan when that was right. established way back. So maybe we have four of them. Um, but those are different from comprehensive planning. What those are are specific instances where someone wants to build something that's not allowed by zoning, and then the town has an opportunity to say yes, we think this is a good idea, or no, we don't think this is a good idea. And so we're starting that process now with regard to this project on Northampton Road. We haven't really gotten too far into it yet, and the town still has an opportunity to have a discussion about it. So if I may, would this be friendly 40B versus unfriendly? I wouldn't really use that yeah. term. I think oh, yeah. the... Um, you know, so the 40B, you know, it's state statute to try to encourage towns to have more affordable housing. And although Chris said it, you know, overrules local zoning, we still have our local zoning to, to guide the development. So the zoning board, you know, the developer has to request waivers from certain land use regulations. And the way it's streamlined is that the zoning board hears all aspects of the case. You know, so they, were, they ask for um, comments from the planning board, from fire, police but it's really just funneled through one permitting board at the time. So instead of having an applicant go to all these different boards, everything is issued under one permit, the comprehensive permit. So it's not as if they can say no to everything. You know, our local regulations are still there and they have to request how it can be waived in the zoning board then weighs the need for affordable housing locally and regionally to the, to the site in the specific project. So is the, are the waivers, you know, um, balancing the need for housing and so it's kind of project you know by project it's looked at I'm, I'm daring to change the subject away from affordable housing um the master plan covered as you said a whole lot of different areas land use and conservation and open space recreation transportation you know all of these i look at some of them and i say some of them are in conflict with each other you know, the need for housing in our town, both workforce and affordable, and I just said I was moving myself away from housing, but, you know, um, conflicts with a desire to preserve conservation land and open space and farming and APR. And so I'm curious where the plan for, say, open space ends and where the plan for housing starts in that is there at any point in time a plan that says we have enough open space, we've a conserved enough land and it's now time to start not conserving the land to keep it from being buildable to it being buildable and how those two that seemingly conflict, everything you conserve you can't build on, um, but we need housing, where those two intersect and how that decision gets made of in terms of buying a piece of land, you know, to conserve it, to take it off the sort of potential building roles. Yeah, uh, Chris. So sometimes those two goals are not in conflict. Um, I can think of one development that happened recently that the planning board approved. Um, Paul Cole is developing eight lots down in South Amherst, right south of Atkins Farm Market um, on the east side of the road. So that was an 11 acre parcel. Um, he's developing a little bit less than half of it and they're going to be single-family homes. Um, you can see some of them being built now. And the town received um, about seven acres of land donated by Mr. Cole to the town for open space. So that was a combined uh, project where we did achieve um, adding homes for people who want them and preserving open space. And that open space is contiguous with other open space on the um, Mount Holyoke Range, so that was a really good project for that in that regard. I think um, you'll note from listening to us talking about the master plan that we're, um, we've all, all along said since 1971 that we want to focus development in the downtown and the village centers. And we have a very small downtown, um, and the village centers vary in size, but that's what we've been trying to do is focus development there for people who want to live here and try not to um, have sprawl throughout the outer portions of Amherst. We have preserved a lot of land, um, but you'll see that there really aren't a lot of new subdivisions being built. In fact, um, I am aware of a couple of subdivisions where 
people aren't really turning over the properties that quickly. So they've been approved since the 80s and people are still not, you know, they're still not built out. So I don't, I don't feel right now that there's a lot of pressure to develop the outlying areas of town. Um, obviously there's pressure to develop in the village center. Yeah. So let me go with developing in village centers then. I think you put a chart up that was um, 2,000 housing units and then 600. And so we are really behind in developing housing units. How does that and the zoning that may need required changed for infill comport with keeping the town feeling like a small town? And how do you then comport those two together? Because if you need to build thousands of housing units to bring the price down to make it livable and affordable in town, and you're limiting it to village centers, you know, the economist in me says, you got to go up. And I'm not sure this town's ready to go up too high. So how do you then balance those two? It, it, they all seem to fit together, and I'm not sure how we figure out how to balance them. Uh, we're going to get an answer to that, then we're going to go back to Councilor Pam. Well, so in okay. my estimate, we've done a pretty good job so far. We're allowing five-story buildings in our downtown, but we don't allow five-story buildings anywhere else. We're allowing residential development along University Drive, which we weren't really allowing previously. We have a new development that's being proposed for the Amherst Motel site, which is right near Domino's, and that's going to have 88 units of, of, of housing with 11 units of affordable housing. So developers are very clever about finding these places that can be developed that are um, close, to, close to services and that their clients will want to live in. So little by little, we're adding to our housing stock, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. So yeah, just to answer quickly on that, I think some of it is though, there may, there may be things that seem to be in conflict. So if you have, you know, you know, really people are talking about open space preservation and then there's people talking about housing, but you know, I think then the devil's in the details. So then we have zoning regulations or other regulations. And so the bigger picture may be that, I don't know if they're always, um, I think they can be more mutually beneficial, not thinking of them as antagonistic, but you know, how can we make them work together? So then that's up to staff and the boards and committees. So, you know, the housing trust is advocating for you know trying to get affordable housing everywhere and it's not saying that we can't have open space either but maybe those two can be a combined project and so i think it's just having you know the communication and creativity when those things come up and so then it's getting down to those really fine details about how does the local regulations try to balance those two things or you know the differing aspects and um well i like the idea of things working together but We've clearly missed an opportunity in the infill development in the downtown uh, where there were no affordable units included. Um, and we talk about uh, affordable housing, particularly at the lower end in Northampton and their downtown in the village center where people can walk out. There's many things to do and there's access to public transportation. And yet we built the we. Someone, <laughs> I did not, built those big buildings and they're not really family homes and they're not meeting the affordable housing thing. So I, I, I just think that we need to remember that we have to really keep the target on, on if you're going to have affordable housing, put it in the right places. And if you're going to do a lot of infill downtown, which is a complicated structure, a co complicated idea, where it borders on residential neighborhoods, which you know I really do think we have to protect the residential neighborhoods. That opportunity was missed. Now, it may be that that could be dealt with in some better way in the future in the downtown. I don't know. Just, so it's interesting. I, I wonder what the, um, so I grew up in an actual small town, which was um, much smaller than Amherst. So Amherst is actually a big, complicated place. Its census population was almost 40,000, which rivals you know, Northampton. So it's actually only by some definitions would it be considered, I mean, it might be considered a town, but small town. And I, I saw that in the introduction to the master plan. So I wonder what the next step is, right? So we're, are we a small city? Are we a medium size? Because we have changed form of government. So we're still called the town of Amherst, but, but it's, small town seems to be a little bit misleading that we're a, 
medium town, yay, <laughs> or, or a big town, but, but small towns, yeah. yeah, we all bump into each other all the time, and we all know what each other's doing yeah. all the time, so we're something different than that. Yeah, go ahead. So I also think that there are a number of opportunities for developing that are, haven't been really looked at yet, and um, there are places in the north end of downtown uh, between the two new buildings that we have that, that may be redeveloped. Um, that's really not going to affect the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods are pretty well protected by their zoning and also by um, this local historic district that was recently established over in the Lincoln Sunset area. Um, there's very little that can be done over there that's not uh, approved by the local historic district. And they're fairly strict in their requirements. So I don't feel that there's a threat to the neighborhoods over there. I think that we need to take a look at some of the other areas that surround our downtown, what we call the BL or limited business di districts, and those are the north side of Triangle Street, the um, west side of Kendrick Park as you go, go south, not even including Kendrick Park, but the area south of Halleck Street, um, and then there's an area along South Prospect Street, and those areas are really underdeveloped, but they don't have to be developed to the extent that downtown is developed. So look at those areas, see what kind of um, height would we be willing to live with, what kind of form would we be willing to live with, how many units, and that's, that's a real opportunity for us to look at. There are also probably spaces on University Drive, particularly the west side of University Drive, that are all one story, um, kind of minimally useful yeah. retail places. I pard pardon me if anybody owns one of those places, but it's really a place that's not being used to its fullest um, extent. So there are several of those places around town. We also have a development that's being proposed over in East Amherst, uh, right in back of Florence Savings Bank. Someone's proposing to build 62 apartment units there. So people are finding these places to build more housing. Um, some of them are coming along with affordable housing, some of them aren't, so sometimes we have to propose projects that are completely affordable housing. Um, but in my opinion, it seems to be kind of working pretty well the way it is. Um, and we are providing more housing, in the last 10 years we've provided, I don't even know if Nate has uh, I think it's 500 units in the last five years. Is that right, Nate? Right. So by, by building permit, you know, there's been over 500 units permitted in the last five years. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think to your question, I think, you know, the, as Chris said earlier, the master plan is a dynamic document. So, you know, my thought is that if there's things that the community sees and we're not sure about, then it's a chance to pause and reflect and, you know, do we change local regulations? you know, what is the process for moving forward? So the master plan is this bigger, you know, 10-year document. And so, you know, again, hopefully it has the, the, the goals and the overall vision we'd like, and then how do we implement that, you know, gets borne out by the planning board or zoning board staff and the community from time to time. Um, you know, and, and I, I think some of it is though, again, as a, guideline, as a guiding document, even zoning, it's not, you know, we're not requiring things of a developer or property owners, and so, you know, there's a, a private market and a lot of things that are outside of our control. So for me, the question is, you know, how do land use regulations, how prescriptive are they, uh, but also allow flexibility to achieve what we want in the master plan, you know, to balance all these different uh, objectives. So I think, you know, having, you know, these questions are great and it's a chance to reflect and see, you know, are there things we can amend or change? So I was going to suggest that we go to public comment. Is is that okay with yes, the, if I please the, so we're gonna to go to public comment. So yeah, oh, thank you so much. So um, we typically limit public comment to three minutes. Is there anyone that would like to speak during public comment? I see one hand, I see two hands. So please come forward and use the mic. Introduce yourself, tell us where you, typically you would tell us your name, your address, and then we'll give you three minutes. And we don't typically engage in conversation. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Steve George. I live on Dana Street. My wife Katie. When we heard about the uh, open meeting that was held in the last week of April about the 
uh, low-income housing on 132 Northampton Road. We weren't a bit concerned. It seemed like a good idea generally. But when we heard the details, we were very concerned, as were many other residents, and we did attend that meeting. And as we learned more, we remained very concerned about the details. If it was a few apartments, you know, the, in the, roughly in the existing structure or a little expanded, apartments that might have families as well as single people, uh, that would be wonderful for the, for the town and the neighborhood. But what's contemplated here is 28 single occupants, of whom Valley CDC says 20 will be male, some will have social services uh, needs in a building that has very little common spaces. No one would build a college dorm with so little space outside the rooms. The rooms are 15 by 16 feet. That includes a small bathroom and a kitchen area. These are very, very small units, 28 of them in this residential area. What will these people do? Okay, well, Councillor Pam has already said that this is not close to the town center. The idea that they will go in the middle of winter down to Big Y and carry groceries back is not realistic. Um, only seven parking spaces are, uh, are planned, so 21 people will uh, be without cars. This is a concerning development, and I'll give you one specific thing that's gonna happen to our neighborhood, and we've checked it out. This property borders Amherst College playing fields, the Pratt Field and the Gooding Field, and uh, those fields are now kept open to the neighborhood pretty much all the time. I'm not sure in the middle of the night, but certainly from early morning until dark, people can go in there, and we do. We go there to access the bike path, to get to the college, just for general recreation. And the college has said in an email reply to a letter that we sent that they are contemplating closing that access to the public even before or if the thing is built as it presently is is planned, and definitely if there's even a single problematic interaction with residents. And those residents are gonna naturally, where are they gonna go? No recreation space on site, no, essentially no common spaces. They're gonna to wanna to go there. That place is gonna be closed off. That is really a serious loss to our neighborhood. So I would suggest, you know, you guys, maybe there are outside forces and you can't just say no, and we don't wanna say no, but do you need to fund it right now? I mean, can't you wait until these, some of these issues have been resolved? If this was smaller, if there was more common space or recreational facilities on site, that would go a long way to alleviating these, these issues. So I think the, the, the fact of the project is not a huge question, but the actual details are very problematic. So we hope you would consider waiting until some of these are resolved before adding even more town money. Oh. Thank you. And, and so I I'm should. not planning to comment, but I am asking if you would go back to the town clerk and write down your name and address. Thank yeah. you. Can, my name is Kate Trost, and I live at 99 Dana Street. And I want to say I was on town meeting for 11 years. And I, um, I think I stepped down in 2014. And um, I'm very pleased with the... Um, Councillor discussion here today. I feel as though this is a we're at, we're at the beginning of an opportunity to really make some coordinated decisions for our town. And as you've said, it's a very complicated place. Um, I went. I found out from an abutter a week ago on Wednesday <clears throat> about this um, Valley CDC 132 Northampton Road. Um, proposed development. And I believe before that, George Ryan did send an, a newsletter sometime a month or so, perhaps before, saying something was going to happen there. Um, I had known that this property um, was owned by the Keaty family, and I, I knew people that lived there. Um, I, was I, I saw that it sold. I went to this meeting and I was very surprised, as was the previous speaker, about the details of what was proposed. So the footprint of the finished building will be, um, it will go from 1,277 square feet to 6,720 <clears throat> square feet. Instead of it being an addition to the existing building, the existing building will be, it will be mostly an addition and the proposal is for a four-story building. And this is on a 0.88 acre site. So um, I wanted to make note of that. Um, and so to me, the size of this structure will be out of scale with 
the surroundings. And um, for those of you who don't know our neighborhood that well, our neighborhood, the way I see it, is Dana Street, um, Orchard Street, Blue Hills, um, Sunset, South Sunset. Um, then there's another street south of the fields. Somebody knows what that is. Blake? Is it Blake? Or Hazel? Hazel, yeah. yeah. And it really is a beautiful downtown neighborhood, yeah. which I cherish, really. Yeah. And I chose to live there because I could walk to town. It was, there's a lot, number of beautiful homes. And this came sort of out of nowhere, like it land, landing all of a sudden. And it deserves careful attention. I understand the housing, um, the low-income housing proposal has been out there for several years. I've been doing some due diligence. But this specific site has only been um, owned by the Valley CDC, I believe, since January. And as far as we know, no specific traffic studies have been done. The, the uses of the Amherst College field surrounding this site have not been taken into account. The scale of this relative to the surroundings hasn't been fully developed. The, whether the parking is going to be sufficient, whether emergency vehicles can get in and out, there are just so many details. And um, this is, sounds funny, but I even care about Amherst College because this is going to be pretty much right on top of their football area. And I think in the lo we could be creating a lot of, seeing a lot of problems down the road created. I wanted to say that. So we have uh, to wrap. Yeah. yeah. And one think... last thing about zoning and all that. The colleges create a lot of parking issues. And these need to be taken into consideration with all the parking studies that we do. Our, our road, Dana Street, is impacted tremendously by the improvements that have been made to the Gooding Pratt Field. People park on it all, all the time. It, we've become like a parking lot for the Amherst College Fields. And um, I notice UMass students park on Lincoln Ave. Oh, that's another part of our neighborhood. They park there, and I, I don't know um, how, much, how much oversight is given to some of these things when, this, when these institutions make their improvements, but they need to be because they have a big impact on the neighborhood. So I'm hoping that we can work out a, a project, if it, it's going to go forward, that will fit into our neighborhood and not disturb and force people to feel like they need to move, which people are talking about, if this of this scale happened. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we have another Hi. public commenter. Yes. yes, my name is Ann Yee, and I live at 29 Dana Place, right off of Dana Street. Um, and what I wanted to follow up on is what Kate was talking about, is about the size of the unit. Um, given the impact of traffic, given the impact of, um, we were in a discussion we had emergency vehicles not being able to get in and get out effectively. Um, I, I had heard there would be 14 parking spots, maybe there's seven, I don't know which it is, 14, and um, that for 28 units, um, there, is no, there is no bus stop right outside. They'd have to cross over to Amity, and I think it's very real to get to, to the issue of getting down the hill and back up the hill in the winter. Um, albeit if, you, if the sidewalks were increased in size, maybe they'll be shoveled more effectively. But I think that's still a little bit of a barrier. Um, and then if you have people with disabilities, uh, that's even more of a barrier. Uh, secondly, I had a question. Um, in listening to the presentation earlier, I was I was noting how many units were affordable housing units in the totality of the units provided at different locations. I, I pulled out my little handy calculator because I don't do this in my head. Um, and the one that was quoted near Mill District was 26 units that would be affordable out of 130. That's 20%. On University Drive, it was four units out of the 36 total. That would be 11%. The one near Domino's, I missed the name, was going to be Aspen Heights. Okay, was going to be 11 units out of 88 total units. That's 12.5 percent. The one we're looking at is 100 yeah. percent affordable housing out of the 20. You know, so it's 28 out of 28. And I wanted to know why that was chosen to be that way, and that's up and beyond the question of 28 being a very large number for that site and for the capacity of the road right there. And getting in right there is also 
it's very interesting. Um, we've only lived at Dana Place for half a year. And I've, I thought, wow, we're lucky. We don't live on Lincoln because everybody, the, the, the traffic backs up just, just east of Dana. And I thought, we don't have to get stuck in that traffic. And that's exactly where that, that driveway is going in. So the traffic really backs up right into there. And it's, it's chock-a-block full straight into downtown. Thank you. I see another hand for public comment. My name is John Hornick, um, and I am the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and I have followed the development of this project since Valley CDC first conceived of it probably more than two years ago. Obviously, it wasn't cited in this particular place at that time, but it's been in process for quite a while. Um, I understand the concerns that the neighbors have raised, um, but I think they're not necessarily something that town council should be dealing with. We have a zoning board of appeals, as was described before. Many of the issues that they have been raised are under the purview of the Zoning Board of Appeals. That's not to say that the Town Council couldn't say, okay, we're going to look at traffic, we're going to look at other things. I also have read the document that was shared with Town Council members, and I think what it represents is a great fear of who is going to be in residence at this facility. And it's an overblown fear. These people do not represent any greater threat to public safety than people who already live in these neighborhoods. We know that even on our ordinary neighborhoods, people have drug abuse problems, criminal problems, other things. These are people who, for whom housing will actually be a deterrent, will provide a way to deal with problems they've had in the past, and also, most importantly, provide an affordable place to live. People become homeless because they can't afford things. Why they can't afford things? Well, if you look at the work of Elizabeth Warren, we know that families go into bankruptcy or individuals because they lose a job, because they have a major medical problem, and certainly some of the people, and I think it's roughly 10 individuals that they expect would be homeless, will have that kind of a background. That means, that doesn't mean they can't live safely in this neighborhood or anywhere else. My sense is that the neighbors are throwing up as many different objections as they can think of, hoping something will stick. And I think if we turn away from this, there'll probably be no place in Amherst where we can develop affordable housing. We will have set a precedent that neighbors can come with whatever objections they have and uh, ask our elected representatives to turn, to turn down whatever the project is that's being proposed. I think that to reject this project would set a very bad precedent. There may be some modifications that are appropriate to ask Valley CDC to make, but in general, to simply say we're not going to fund it, we're going to set it aside right now and forever would be a very big mistake. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim Adderidge, and I live at 143 Northampton Road, which is an abutting property to the proposed 132 Northampton Road uh, VCDC uh, redevelopment. And in deference to the previous speaker, uh, I disagree with him on several levels. Um, perhaps if I lived on Amity Street, or if I lived on Lincoln Avenue, or maybe even on the end of Blue Hills Road towards Amity Street, I wouldn't be so concerned. But this, uh, you've heard the uh, term before, uh, NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. Well, this is not in my front yard, because this literally is in my front yard. And with the 
advent of the DOT reconstruction of Northampton Road, I'm going to lose about 10 feet of my front yard. And um, that, that's a different story. But specifically about this uh, proposed 132 Northampton Road development is that I cannot see how it is going to enhance the character of our neighborhood, which in the master plan, it said one of the ideas is to maintain the character of neighborhoods and community. Uh, I don't see this maintaining the character of this particular neighborhood. And as far as uh, the comments about approaching town councilors about sweeping away something like this, I would not suggest that at all. I would suggest that people who have a vested interest in seeing this property not developed have an opportunity to let their feelings be known. Thank you. But I see no more hands up, so, so we don't respond to public comment, but we've certainly heard everyone that spoke today. So I'm gonna suggest that we keep moving along our agenda. So the next order is business not anticipated 48 hours in advance. So I'm not, go, well, no. yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure exactly how, so we do have, we, two things were referred to us um, at the last council meeting, which was less than 48 hours, and I'm not sure this is the right place, but I, two things that were referred to us were the speed limit, the proposal to look at speed limits in Amherst, and the other one is to look at the Airbnb or short-term rental policy. So I'd like to add that, yes? Let me just be very clear. The speed limit one does, is not time sensitive. However, the Airbnb tax yep. is time sensitive. Yep. So if you would. So, yeah, so I, I propose I that we add that to our next. I'd that. like to add that to our next agenda in addition to the planning and zoning discussion. So, um, Ms. Andy. Yeah, uh, um, as chair of the finance committee, it was referred to two committees because it really has financial implications and it has implications for uh, community resources. And just so that you're aware, the Finance Committee does have this on the agenda for Tuesday of next week, the Airbnb. Airbnb. Yes. Okay. Are there any other agenda items that we should be considering for future CRC meetings? So our plan then would be to do planning and zoning next week, along with the Airbnb discussion. And then I forget what after that, my short term, <laughs> my long term memory takes me to next week. So. Don't lose sight, that you, sight of the fact that at some point you need to communicate back to me uh, the more detailed aspects of the goals of the council. Yeah. Continue discussion of the goals. Right. Yeah. And activities that go with that or to communicate that you need an extension in time on the activities, thank you. And so actually, there's, John Page just walked in and he was a prompt, I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you in a second. So John Page just walked in and he was a prompt for, there's a discussion on economic, the economic development panel that was um, planned for a couple of weeks ago has been rescheduled for May 29th, more or less around the time of our council meeting. So one suggestion is that on May 29th that we go to that panel instead of meeting. So on Wednesday, May 29th, have that be our meeting participation in, or not participation, but attending. Yes? That will not be an official meeting of the council. No, that would uh, be just It a will be a panel. If council would like to attend, they may be, we will not be convening it as a council meeting. Maybe I miss, you know, I, Mr. Andy is going to explain actually what. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that you've got the point that the uh, conflict in time is with the meeting of this committee. Yeah. Not the council's all. So I guess we could simply cancel this meeting on May 29th, and then if those who can, can attend that meeting. Was that kind of what you were thinking? I was thinking at least that the committee should uh, consider that about 48 hour notice because we didn't have 48 hour notice. But uh, um, 
if we didn't, if we if attending that economic development um, forum, which is very much within the charge of this committee, is an important opportunity, then uh, as a committee we need to resolve the conflict in time between the, when the panel is scheduled and this committee is scheduled to meet that day. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Kate, can you come up to the, use the mic? I found out about this meeting on the town council calendar, and the agenda uh, for today is different than the agenda that you've had. So I just wanted you to know that it had call to order, planning and zoning overview, CPAC project review, public comment, business unanticipated. So I just wanted you to know that. I mean, it worked out that people came and we were able to speak, but you might just want to make sure that it's up to date. Okay. So I had sent no shame, no a blame. Um, corrected agenda or the... So what happened is we canceled our meeting. No, we, we changed, the, changed. Uh, changed our meeting last week. So agenda items got moved. And I sent the revised agenda up the chain um, last Friday. So the error was made somewhere along the way. My apologies. So this was a this you copy this today the calendar or it's what it, it is what is on the town website. When did you print this out? This morning. Interesting. So they, didn't, they, didn't they didn't update it. I'm sorry. When will that be? The CPAC project review. Um, that happened on. That's going to be. It's coming out. Isn't April twenty fourth. Well, I wasn't there. It was the meeting that you... We did, we did discuss it April 24th. Right. Please use your mics. Yeah. We did discuss it April 24th, um, and we voted on it. Um, since then, um, uh, it's thought that we need to look at the 500,000 bond issue um, again. Um, and I think we we're going to discuss it again at a uh, CRC meeting. I'm not sure. In, uh, let me, Dave has his oh. hand up also. I'll take a look at the, the posting issue with Angela upstairs. Um, I did want to remind you that I think, Steve, you had said on the 24th, um, or excuse me, the 22nd, that would be kind of a flex meeting. We'll develop the agenda based on today's discussion, the zoning yes. discussion next week. So we should have plenty of time to look at the town council goals and objectives on the 22nd. And I'll get back, to, we'll get back to your, your comment in a second. But we also want to meet with the zoning subcommittee. Is that what you, um, Mr. Stutzman, do you want to speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Greg Stutzman, Chair of the Planning Board and Chair of the Zoning Subcommittee. Please uh, speak into the mic. Yes, the mic is on. I believe I'm speaking into it. Um, so I just wanted to share an invitation. If it's already been shared, I apologize for the duplication of efforts. But after your zoning forum next week, the zoning subcommittee will be meeting at 5 o'clock. The zoning subcommittee had discussed posting that meeting of ours as a joint meeting of the zoning subcommittee and the CRC, so any members would be welcome to attend. And that date is? That date is next Wednesday, this the 15th coming? at 5 p.m. Okay, so, the, and does, so that would be, the proposal is that we meet at 5 to 7 on the, for our next meeting. Does that work for the is CRC? That, is the proposal that you meet from 5 to 7 with them? Or, yeah. David, I'm looking at you. Or is it that we meet in addition? I think it's No, it's in addition to. Oh, in addition. So the mega meeting. Yeah, so okay. We would meet 2.30 to 4.30. And then, then a five to half hour to go shower and then come. <laughs> That's right. 2.30 to 4.30 for your meeting. Yep. And then the zoning subcommittee meets from 5, five to 6.30. And you're invited to their meeting. Okay. That's perfect. And then to the planning board after that. <laughs> Life doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> um, so back to the question that uh, Councillor Pam has raised and, and uh, Kate Trost has raised. How do we want to proceed on this question? That well, the finance committee was going to, um, I, I, had, I went to New York for a funeral. I, that's what I raced back today. So I missed the finance committee yesterday. Was this brought up? Um, yeah. at the Finance Committee, the question of the bond issue? No, because it's been noticed for the subsequent meeting. Okay. It's, it is on the meeting for May 23rd that we will 
at finance be taking up the CPAC proposals? That is also listed as a committee of the whole, meaning the full council is welcome to come and participate as full counselors. So I will fully acknowledge that um, the CRC was formed mid-April, and our, I think our very first meeting, um, this was on the agenda. I missed that meeting, and you know I did read the, the draft minutes, but I missed the meeting, I missed the discussion. Um, I know that this is a really, I mean, we all know that this is a very important issue for for those of you that are here today, for others in the community, for those who may be living, you know, in these units that, you know, they also have an interest, you know, in this project. And so I think we as a council need to figure out the best way of hearing the concerns both sides. I mean, the con opportunities and concerns both sides. So one thing we could do is simply let the finance committee do its work. That's the next step for, for your, you know, for your input. It will go to the full council for discussion when we talk about the budget. And that's another opportunity for the community to talk about your concerns at this phase. I mean, I think that the one thing we recognize is that when things are referred to different committees because different committees have charges, both of which may um, be relevant to the ultimate decision being made. Uh, we just a few minutes ago uh, touched on the uh, question of whether there should be a 3% additional um, fee for rentals at Airbnbs, which is now permitted by state law on a local option basis. It was referred to two committees because the two committees have relevance to the ultimate decision, but have different charges. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would expect that the uh, discussion that w would happen at the Finance Committee for that one will be different from the discussion that will happen here. Uh, when the Finance Committee takes up Community Preservation Act proposals, it will be looking at it from financial budgetary concerns uh, sort of on the uh, all, all levels, but it will be focusing solely as uh, financial questions that may relate to that particular proposal. Uh, a number of issues were raised today and in other correspondence that um, I have uh, been a party to or seen that is um, uh, obvious concerns to the neighbors because they expressed them today. Uh, and uh, they may have been things we would have talked about had it been raised earlier when it was uh, brought up at an earlier meeting. Uh, but it is a different set of topics from what the Finance Committee is likely to be talking about relative to uh, the Community Preservation Act proposals. Here's what I suggest, and we have our president here. So if this were a town meeting year, you know, um, what would happen is that the, the C Community Preservation would have made its recommendations. Those recommendations would have gone to the select board and then they would have gone to town meeting. And so there would have been a discussion with the 240, what was the number, 256 town meeting, including the ex officio, yep. Um, they're on the floor. So having that discussion here at this brand new committee of five, doesn't seem like the right, you know, at this point it seems like the, 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 the discussion should really be happening at the town. It's a very important issue. And I think it should be happening at the, town council level. So, so really what I'm suggesting is that rather scheduling a meeting here with the, uh, with the five members of this committee, and then we report to the full council, we should just allow enough time at a full council meeting to have, and just budget enough time to have the discussion there. Yeah, I think so. So there's a couple things that are on the floor at the same time. Uh, first of all, if Community Resources Committee, which has already voted to recommend for the CPAC, uh, wants to reconsider, that is their decision. 
Okay? Uh, I'm personally not a member of this committee. That's your decision. The, uh, there are other times when the full budget or this particular, um, the CPAC recommendations will come before the council or a part of the council. The first is um, at a hearing, which will be on the 21st at 6.30 in the evening at the Bang Center. The second time the CPAC will come before the council, our part of the council is at the Finance Committee, which is on the 23rd at 2 o'clock. We tend to go to 5 o'clock, and uh, particularly at this time of the year. And in that case, uh, we will be having the CPAC people actually come and present their proposals, and there will be public comment. And then once the Finance Committee completes its review of the budget, and it, within the 30 days that it was referred to us, it will then go to the, back to the town council, and the first time the town council will take up consideration of the full budget, which includes CPAC, is on June 3rd at our 6.30 Monday night meeting in this room. Andy? I guess I could question for the president. Um, there's a statutory requirement and a charter requirement that there's a date specific for completion of the adoption of the budget, but the budget is actually the consolidated operating budget that does not include the Community Preservation Act decisions. Uh, Community Preservation Act is actually a separate process, yeah. and um, therefore, uh, I think that it's a decision that uh, we as a council leave to you as president as to the appropriate time, but it does not have to necessarily be coupled to the deadline of the budget adoption. Uh, you are absolutely correct. The Mar the June 30th, 30th deadline is for the operating budget of the town so that we can continue to do our work. And the uh, CPAC, however, can actually be done any time during the year. It's just that it has always tended to come up in the spring because it's always tended to be at the spring annual town meeting. So um, this is, uh, we may at some point decide to delay all or part of CPAC at this point, um, that recommendation nor that decision has been made. But I take your um, thoughts into consideration. Thank you. You look like you're about to say something. Yeah, this is a open, yeah, this is full council. If um, you are, as a group, satisfied with your recommendation on um, the CPAC proposal, there's no reason for you to revisit it, but realize that at the council meeting, when we discuss it, um, as I will with the finance committee report, I, I and others will have questions, I assume for you, and um, I hope that you'll be able to answer them. So you want to, I think, think about how that discussion went and the depth that it, it took, and whether, and if you're satisfied with it, fine, but if you're not, and I realize you've got a lot on your plate, and it's not right, if you're not, you might, I would urge you to consider um, revisiting it one more time, um, but that's re obviously up to you. But I know as a counselor, um, when things come back from committees, um, I, I rely on that a great deal. And if all I get is, you know, we voted approval, and that's about all I hear, um, I'm disappointed. So I'm hoping that um, what you do give to us will come with uh, some kind of description and some kind of rationale for the approval. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's what I would expect. Um, then perhaps uh, I would suggest that the <clears throat> Community Resources Committee reconsider that vote after the re meeting of the Finance Committee, which th considers it. That feels odd to me. Yeah. Do you want to? No, I'm fine. Yeah. All I said was that feels odd to me, but I haven't got articulated right now what's bothering well, me about it. The issue of the 500,000 bond issue Hello, has to be gone into in more detail. So 
uh, we haven't said this in a while in a council meeting that we're uh, flying the plane while we build it. Uh, but to some extent, CRC had to, right? And so uh, George and I both serve on outreach communications and appointments. Um, and we have spent the last uh, five months coming up with a process for dealing with appointments. Um, but in January, we had to deal with Board of License Commissioners. And those were sent to us. And we said, we haven't had time to discuss how we vet things and how you evaluate things. And so we sent it to the council. And so George just said, you know, as a counselor, he would, he would always want to know why. And in that case, if you had asked us why, we would have said, we weren't ready. And it had to get done, right? Um, and so I think that you were in the unfortunate situation where we threw something at you that you really weren't ready for. But the reality is we don't know how long it will take. And so this council to date has been marked by these one-offs of, we'll probably do this differently in the future, but for now, this is what we had to do based on what we have. Uh, I think that your committee has a lot of work to do to figure out how you actually, what your role is when you review. That's gonna take time. Um, and so I think that uh, for me as a counselor, not to conflict with my esteemed colleague, I would be fine if you just said, we voted it because they were recommended by CPAC, and CPAC does a lot of legwork to vet these proposals, and we, we trust their recommendation because we haven't yet had the opportunity to figure out how we vet proposals. To me, that would be a perfectly adequate um, circumstance with the understanding that next year when CPAC proposals come to you, I probably would want to know more about it. But to some extent, you're a very young committee, and uh, it took Oka months before we could actually offer a rationale. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to feel like you're on, on the hot seat while you're still trying to figure out who you are. And there's also the technical <laughs> detail that a motion to reconsider requires that everyone who is here, I, I was reading Robert's rules, would have to still be here. Um, everybody who voted in the, with a majority would have to be here to vote to reconsider. Someone who voted in the majority has to bring it forward for reconsideration. Yes, and everyone who was, according to the and a committee, everyone that was here voting would also have to be here for this vote. And Sarah's not here, so I, I think that I think that what Council Ross said is exactly what I was thinking: is that this was the first thing put on us. I mean, this is reading through the minutes. I wasn't there. In, um, we voted with the, the, the recommendation of the CPA committee. Whether or not we should have abstained on that vote, who knows. But I think that it's, it's um, making larger than life what the, we're only advisory to the whole town council. So we could have another hearing. You guys could all come out and you know, say we, and new, you know, new people will join or you know, whatever. And we'll still report to the full council, and the full council will still want to hear, you know, from all of you. So I think, in the interest of, you know, weirdly we set up the committees to be more efficient, but I think in the, this particular circumstance, which there are so many people here that want to speak to that, I think it's more efficient for us to recommend that you come and speak, well, to the finance committee, but then to the full council. Yeah. I want to make a small clarification yeah. because I feel like, uh, well. I appreciate what you said and agree. We yep. are uh, young at what we're doing. Uh, come closer, like I said, Matt and Nate should do. Um, I feel that um, after some, personally looking at different research, I've looked at plans, yep. I've gone to visit things, and I'm not saying one way or another how I would vote, but those visits and uh, reviewing plans and seeing the common space yep. and garden spaces that are part of the project gave me information that I felt like was also supporting a decision-making yep. process. Um, so I think that has to be, yeah. we didn't just do it because we felt like it, but because there were good reasons as yep. well. Thank you, thank you. Did you have your hand up? Unless you are, have anything further to say on whether you're going to take this up, I just have one other thing that I'd like to communicate to the public. Um, go ahead. OK. Uh, the other thing I want you to know is that in addition to CPAC recommendations coming before the council that can be acted on at any time, we can also accept all, reject all, accept some, reject some, accept some, defer some, so there's a serious opportunity in the future as the council takes this fully on. 
and after the Finance Committee has reviewed this, to uh, look at that. I just wanted the public and those of you who have taken your time to come here today to understand that it's not an all or nothing one way or the other, and it's not all done by June 30th, okay? Thank you. Did, Kate, did you have your hand up one more time or no? Was that, am I misremembering? I feel like this um, proposal has significant, such significance that it shouldn't be rushed. And I feel a tremendous feeling of rushed. And I appreciate that, that, that this particular location has only been known to some since January, but most of us about two weeks. I think it deserves careful attention to all the details because the implications will be permanent. That's all. Thank you. So we're after our time. Do we want to try to deal with the minutes? I think we should. Yeah. So uh, we, we, there's no one up. No. Yeah. So we have minutes from April 24th and yeah, you can. We have the minutes. From, yes. Uh, we have the minutes from April 24th and April. Um, I don't even have the dates. Who has their agenda open? Um, I'm just going to ask. Unless there's any other council broad business, there's three of us here that are not part of the committee. And do I have a motion from among all of us to adjourn the committee of the whole? You don't want to. Pat's moved and. Uh, Steve has seconded that. Oh, wait, that. I want you guys to stay here for the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Are those in favor of adjourning the Committee of the Whole? <laughs> okay. Get, is it, Pass this down to Ann. Yeah. Was it unanimous? Thank Pass you. Yeah. I think that's... So we have the minutes of April 11th. You've been sent the minutes of April 11th and April 24th. And we just, we have a handout of a draft minutes of the meeting of May 1st. So do we want to take them one at a time? Or do you want to consider the ones that were emailed to you first, the April 11th and April 20th? Yeah. Yeah, do you, is that a motion? <laughs> I move that we uh, accept the minutes from both meetings. So there's a motion and a second to approve the Accept the minutes of April 11th and April 24th. There was a second, right? Uh, no. There wasn't a second. Is there a second? second. There's a second. So, um, all in favor, raise your hand. Yeah, passes three zero. Passes three zero. Three zero two. Uh, do we want to thank you so much for the minutes of May 1st? And I couldn't open these, so I couldn't send them out to you ahead of time. Do, should we? Um, I don't want to say. When I, I, you'll see a place in the minutes which says um, motion, four to one. Not clear here. It doesn't seem like much of a motion. In other words, from my notes, I was pretty unclear what, we, what went on there. So I'm asking you to, and I did these about four days ago. I'm asking you to read them very carefully and then to make additions or corrections okay. as required and to run it yeah. by you because I really wasn't sure what yeah, that motion sense. was. It, it, my notes just contradicted themselves. So we'll send these to you and then consider these at the next meeting, is that? So I, I think that we made a motion about committees in general minutes that the chair gets them, a bit, people get them, the chair is the one that says, okay, this is fine. So if people have corrections or comments, they should give them to the chair. Um, isn't that, didn't we have that motion, that kind of way of doing business, Lynn? Because we found that when we did round robin them that nobody ever said, oh yes, they're finalized. Several committees have decided that the one person on the committee will in fact approve the minutes. What I cannot honestly recall is whether this committee has decided that. All right, so I'm going to make a motion. It is shaking his head no. Yeah. But I'm, you may want to do that for the future. Yes, could, could I make a motion that this committee, um, that people read the draft minutes and channel their additions and corrections 
to the chair and that the chair make the final decision of accepting them. Otherwise, we'll have a pile up of minutes. Oh, so um, we don't have to go back to the whole, oh, wow. Yes. In the interest of efficiency, I mean, we're just moving along so fast here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so okay. I, okay. You have a motion you need to second. I need that was second. a motion, there was a second. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay, all in favor, any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. 401. No, yeah, 401. Who's, who's taking the minutes? That's a really good question. I will. Dave took them, right? I, I have scribbled notes from the time I came in, but that's yeah. about so I um, can, I'll put together the minutes. Some of the discussions with a full council meeting, so I can, we can share that with you. And Thank you so much. You. Okay. You, oh. okay. Mar Margaret, question? I, I did give you, sent out a quick little thing. You know that Paul said, those who, who, who wants a, a printed um, budget, and I had emailed back, I do, how do I get it? Okay. I have a whole bunch of printed okay. copies for you. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. By, by uh, acclamation. acclamation.